the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. life mission is to elevate the voices of exceptional individuals with heart-driven passions. He is a best-selling author who has dedicated his life to aspiring writers and authors bring their message to the world and achieve best-selling status. Please welcome the founder of Thriving Best Sellers, Steve Kidd. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Steve Kidd. Steve, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Gabriel. Yeah, thank you for being on. Today, we're going to be talking about thriving bestsellers, because what Steve really does is actually helps individuals write books, if I recall correctly, and then goes ahead and gets those books published. But before we get into all of that, Steve, go ahead and introduce yourself. Who is Steve Kidd? Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third-generation minister, an international best-selling author of now 21 books and counting, um, but I work with entrepreneurs. I'm a marketing company with a strong publishing division. We help people write, publish, market their books to bestseller and beyond. There are several thousands of authors that I've actually worked with now, um, helping them become best-selling authors. And the really cool part about that is, is those thousands of people equate to literally millions of people who have downloaded their book and who, whose lives have been touched by what they put out into the world. That's incredible. And you know, folks, I think the interesting thing when you're, when you think about book writing is for me personally, I'm, I feel like I'm trying to go through that process is I've been doing a lot of blog posts, repurposing that content for a book, right? I, I'm, that's what I'm always thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I always encourage everybody speak to write, um, especially when you're a podcast host like what you are. You're pretty good at talking and stuff. Um, just simply, even better yet, if somebody can interview you, especially somebody that knows where they're going with the interview. But speaking to write is so powerful. I mean, all the way to Sir Richard Branson. That's how he writes his books. So it's not like, you know, only nobody's do that. I mean, the book, The Four Agreements was written speak to write. So explain that. What is speak to write? So in other words, rather than sitting in front of a computer or taking pen to paper, you actually just turn on some type of recording device, Zoom or whatever that might be, um, and you literally just speak out the words. Um, Like I said, the best way of doing that is to have somebody that knows what they're doing and the process of the book um, to interview you, to get you, ask you questions and get you talking Um, but, um, that's really the easiest way to just get all that content out of you. Um, and then bring in people whose expertise is story development and making sure that you have flow and grammar editing and all that kind of stuff. But, um, as far as you being the content expert that you are just purely simply having somebody ask you, well, what do you mean by that, Gabriel? And then having you answer that, uh, there's no more powerful way to get the content out and, less least painful and easiest on you as well yeah and and grammar is so important in fact folks uh i'm not if you if you're subscribing to the newsletter this not a little plug if you're not the shades of e.com uh if if you find a grammar mistake on my newsletter please let me know and i will send you a free sticker for every grammar you find i've actually enlisted my wife to help me because grammar is so (laughs) important so steve tell us more what uh, like let's talk about thriving bestsellers how did you start this company so i mean that's its latest iteration of name because of a divorce i went through and stuff but in 1987 not talking about all the stuff i did in sales prior to graduating from high school. But in 1987, I started a sales and marketing company. We did mostly marketing advice and manufacturers repping of products. Um, And uh, we've been in business doing marketing ever since. We were early adopters in what became known as the internet back in the days of bulletin boards and all the precursors to the internet. 
Um, and we've been in book space since 2007. But yeah, way back in uh, 1987, in February of 1987, um, I had an opportunity to uh, help an organization find some products. And uh, that just kind of blew up into a company that's existed ever since. Now, you mentioned in 2017, you kind of pivoted into the book space. How did that happen? 2007, but yes. So um, it was actually totally by accident. My second youngest daughter and my then wife were huge fans of the movie Twilight. Um, and we <laughs> at the time lived um, outside of Portland. We actually lived in in a little town called St. Helens. Um, and if you uh, if you know anything about Twilight, it was all filmed. The first one was filmed pretty much almost exclusively within an hour drive of Portland because Portland has good enough, uh, you know, hotels that celebrities would stay in them versus out in the middle of nowhere. Anybody that knows the Pacific Northwest knows Forks is the literal definition of the middle of nowhere. And there <laughs> is no true. accommodations for, for celebrities there. Um, so it was all filmed there and they went to all the different locations. They blogged about it. Um, and I then helped them take all of the notes and the blogging and everything they did and turn that into a book and publish that. And that actually at one point was the number one best-selling movie related travel guide on Amazon. Oh, wow. Wow. And so do you just kind of went from blogging to writing a book or helping the blogger to write a book? Yeah. I mean, they were just really just having fun. It started out as a mother daughter trip and people were asking them, what did you learn? What did you discover? And so they took it from there and, and went to a blog and then, uh, because I had some printing stuff I was doing with what we were doing with the company, um, I turned it into a book. It was originally the literal definition of self-published. It came off of a printer at my house, um, and then eventually we moved it on to being printed and, and available on Amazon. That's amazing. Now, you kind of speak, and I, I'm assuming it's probably not, but you kind of make it sound like writing a book is kind of easy. But how difficult is it to write a book? Actually, um, writing a book, okay, and I want to use this word very carefully because everybody should be an author, but very few people are writers. Writing a book is very difficult. Having a book is very easy, and being the content master that you are, because you're the master of being you, you've been that your whole entire life, you know you, um, and putting out what you know thus far, um, that should be and is a is a very simple process, actually. And that's a, there. That's a great point, right? Where being a writer is someone that's actually articulating what you're actually saying versus myself, right? A, a a content creator. To your point, I can do the speak to write method, where yes. I can I can truly just speak to a writer who really knows what they're doing. And man, now you're now you're getting my head turned a little bit like, man, this is actually a little bit more feasible than I'm, I've been truly sitting at home trying to think, like, how, do, how do I write a book? So how did you, how did you finance this venture? Now, for, well, actually first, is this your first business? Well, I mean, technically yes, because I was 19 or 20, I guess I had just turned in 1987. So technically, um, you know, it was my first business. Um, like you said, this is a, a an additional iteration of it because of some situations that happened in my life. Um, back then I financed it old school method. If you want money, you hit the streets and you push, 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 push until somebody buys something. And that's where the money comes from. <laughs> um, you know, these days, uh, you know, I'd have to say that still I do a lot of that, but, you know, I have been blessed to be able to borrow money at certain times, both from family as well as, you know, just traditional loan type of sources and, and do those kind of things to take um, advantage of opportunities. And how difficult would you say your experience has been trying to grow this business? Um, you know, difficult is, is so random because there's been times when it's been excruciating and times when it's been really easy. Um, it really is about consistency. Um, I have found that whatever you do now is really what becomes reflected in what you're going to start seeing showing up about 90 days from now. Um, and the problem that most of us have at least done, if not still do, um, no judgment, it's just we've all done it, um, is when we get 
beyond that 90 days and the effect of 90 days ago is beginning to shine through and we start making money and those kind of things, we stop doing what we did those first 90 days or we slack back a little bit or we don't spend the amount that we did in marketing or all those kind of things. Um, and then another 90 days goes by and then the roller coaster dips again. Um, and it's really about being consistent in those efforts ongoingly. That is what's going to create consistent results. How do you kind of keep going during that 90 day process? Um, lots of prayer, lots of singing and crying. No, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the truth of the matter is that sometimes it's really tough and sometimes what you really just need is some people that are in your corner that are telling you. But um, the biggest piece of that is you need to have documented what you have done so that in the times when things look like or even are not good, you can go back and see all of the successes you've had. Um, I'm a big proponent, actually, even of way back when you're a solar entrepreneur, literally giving yourself like certificates and awards and plaques and, uh, you know, award yourself a trip for the weekend or, um, you know, dinner for two at, at a restaurant or something like that. And then keep the receipts or the tickets or the whatever um, and have kind of your own little hall of fame for the ways you celebrated yourself and the reasons you celebrated those for. So that then when the times get tough, um, you can look back and you can see here's where the tough times were. This is what we did that got through it, you know, and this is also remember that, it may feel like nothing ever goes right, but the truth of the matter is that's not really how it is. Yeah, that's that's very very true. Well said. Now let's let's talk about a little bit about your background. You know your kind of trials and tribulations. You mentioned you started this in the '80s when you're 19, around 19, 20 years old, right? Branding and marketing was probably different then than it is today. I would love to hear Steve's journey through that marketing and branding. How did you market and brand back when you first started? And how has it changed to today? Well, it's changed even more because the first sales job I had, I was five. So, you know, um, <laughs> when you're five, branding and marketing is all you got to do is just show up cute. My brothers, it used to make them angry because they'd go to a house and the people would say no. And then I'd go right behind them and the people would say yes. <laughs> Um, you know, that's really not fair. Um, but as an adult, we'll skip all the things that kids cheat. Um, <laughs> um, as an adult, really, it was a matter of really honestly looking at where the needs were, but then also understanding who, who am I, what, what makes me tick, um, all too often, we begin to look at trends and we chase trends rather than understanding who we are as a person and going deep into being the best version of ourselves versus going wide into whatever cool next thing looks really popular at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And how would you say, what, what would you say are some of the things that kind of shocked you the most in that you've had to adjust to? Um, you know, I think a lot of it really, and this one's going to be maybe really shocking for people is just how the same things actually are compared to how different people want them to be. It's really fun when you, uh, you know, even work with a coach and, and again, not to diss them at all, but they have this new method. And you're like, okay, cool. I want to hear what's really working. Um, and you see, you go to their seminar, you even buy their course and, you, and you're sitting there. And as you're listening to it, you begin to hear the voice of somebody. Um, I, I'm thinking very specifically of one specific one, and I don't want to call the coach out, but I remember there was a gentleman named Jay Douglas Edwards, who is a sales teacher from the 1960s. And the things that this person was teaching other than the fact that they were West Coast and Jay Douglas Edwards was a very East Coast, you could tell from his accent, um, you would have thought that it was him teaching the class. It was just all the same things um, because the basics never go out of style. And when we become really an expert at the basics, um, then we really can have that ongoing success. And when we chase uh, the latest fad, 
when we really drill down on that, we find out, and that's the most shocking always for me is, is it's like, oh, do this new thing and it's really going to work. And then you drill down on it and you find out that what you did is you took three months learning how to get back to doing what you were doing before you started the three months. <laughs> and how would you say, you know, kind of mistakes are common, right? People make mistakes. What are some of those common mistakes that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you've seen uh, in the in the book writing industry that you would love for entrepreneurs to kind of know like, Hey, don't make this mistake. Um, so I'll try not to make the list too long. Um, (laughs) but you know, we talked already about the fact that almost nobody is a writer, but everybody needs to be an author. Um, that's a huge mistake people make. Um, the other really big one is we all tend to want to, regurgitate everything we possibly can imagine thinking of all in our one book. Um, And the truth of the matter is, is that what people really want to know is what is the next step. Um, I always say it as you take one point, you make it really clear, you give them a clear action from that point. And if there's a second point, um, then that's a second book. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. We all use Google to search for things. If you were to search for something in Google, Google does not have the capability to say, you know, contained in chapter 25 of this amazing book is the answer to that question. Whereas if you have a book that is just the answer to that question, um, and Amazon statistics actually even back that up, they found that if a book is 100 pages, I'm talking print pages or less, more than 60% of the people that get the book will read it and finish it. If that goes from 101 to 200 pages, that drops to around 20%. And if the book goes over 200 pages, it's less than 3% of the people that ever even finish the book. And our next steps and our, what are you going to do next? And and the outcome for people is at the end of the book and they never get there. Um, And then people are out there saying, well, this book didn't really help me because, you know, and the truth is, is the because is because I never really finished it. Yeah. You know, you kind of mentioned some statistical data. Do you know kind of like, if there is an author listening right now, there's somebody that wants to be an author. What do readers want? What should they should be like focused on? Yeah. I mean, readers want what Amazon calls short reads again, in order to classify as a short read, it has to be a hundred pages or less. And I'm talking about the print pages, um, you know, an eight and a half by 11 single space to document is going to be about four to six ish pages. Um, you know, so you're not talking about a lot of content people want, they want, uh, you know, if you will, a microwave, you know, they want the answer to whatever question they're asking. They want that. Now they want to be able to get to it, um, to give a person a book that they can read sitting in a doctor's office and get the information they need, um, in car line waiting for kids or, uh, you know, even sitting there like we've all done as parents out waiting when the kids are done with whatever event um, and really legitimately grow in that time. That's really what people are looking for. Um, Because if not, what happens is we write this big book. We have, let's just use 10 steps because all of us tend to start off with 10 steps. Um, And we tell the people you need to take action on step one before you do step two. Almost all of us do that. But all of us as people read through all 10 steps. And then what we want to do is just take action on step 10. And then we're like, why didn't it work? Well, it's because you didn't do step one through nine. Um, and step 10 is based on the success of all of those, not just on jumping up, you know, to the end of the book. Yeah. You know, you, you kind of talk about, you know, gradual success, right? And I kind of think about almost like in the book industry too, with the auto book. Now, do you see, like, do you see listeners leaning more towards the auto books these days versus the paperbacks? Currently right now, um, it's almost exactly a third, a third, a third, uh, a third of the people want eBooks. A third of the people still like the tactile nature of a book you can hold on to. And about a third of them want them in an audiobook form. I also know a lot of people, um, with the audiobooks that a lot of people will listen to the audiobook even for a book that they want to own. You know, it's your favorite author, but who has the time to sit down and write and to read a whole entire novel by somebody that you just love reading it. But if you can plug it into the car and listen to an hour of the, you know, when you're talking a novel, you're talking usually 15 to 18 hours um, at 
one X speed. Um, some of us listen to it faster than that, but you know what I mean? Um, you know, even with that, we will do that, but we still kind of want to own that book. Um, also though, from a marketing standpoint, only about one out of 20 books is available in audiobook form. So there's as much demand as all the other formats, but there isn't as much supply, which means that you're more likely to get more people um, when you do have that that available for your book. You know, and, and to that point, have you seen um, readers willing to, so you mentioned the Amazon, you, you know, 60% or 60 some odd percent of the people are going to finish the book. If it's within the hundred pages or less Then as the pages go up, the numbers go down. Have you seen readers being willing to take on larger books and audio format versus the reading? Cause I, I agree. Like I would, I would, I'm like a two X, like I'm a, I'm gonna listen to it on two X, right? So I'm 1.5, two X. So I get down quicker, but I'm still able to retain the information. I'm thinking to myself, and I'm wondering if you've seen it, I probably would be willing to take on a larger book, right, to listen to it on an auto version than a paper. Have you seen that as well? It's kind of yes and no, um, because there's two sides to that fence. On the one hand, yes, um, it's very easy to plug in an audio book and listen to it while whatever we're doing. Okay. Um, sometimes very actively listening to it and sometimes very passively listening to it. Um, but the flip side to that is when we look at the book, um, you know, I have an audible account. Most of it, a lot of us do when you look, you're looking through books and it brings it up and it says, this book is 18 hours. This book is 15 hours. All of us have that immediate shock value, even if it's totally, and it's like, I'm going to get this book. It wouldn't matter if it was 3000 hours, you know, it still gives us that shock value of when the heck in my life with as busy as it is, am I going to have 18 hours? And so then we end up listening to the audiobook in the shower and while we're shaving and, you know, doing all those things. Um, so it, it's kind of both, you know, I mean, it has a, a lot of appeals to it um, and people will take on a little bit longer. Again, though, the problem, and I'll give you a perfect example. If you're familiar with Mike Michalowicz's book, Profit First, um, or if you're familiar with the book, Atomic Habits, uh, both of those are perfect examples of of very effective uh, 350-ish page books. Um, Mike in, a, in a Profit First literally actually says at one point of the book, don't go on any further until you do this thing I just told you to do. What he should have done is stopped there, made them go and buy a second book or even gifted them the second book, but had it be the end because we all like that success of completion. Um, and that's where the longer audiobooks start giving us problems is, you know, when we've invested, let's just say a whole, you know, we're driving someplace really long and it's a five hour drive. And, you know, when we get done with that five hour drive, you know, the book is even at double speed, the book isn't even halfway through yet. Um, rather than feeling that sense of accomplishment, we kind of have that sinking feeling and it makes us go, you know, maybe I won't get the next book in audio. Maybe I'll just, you know, skip it. And uh, and there's a lot of good material that's out there. Uh, when we talk about Atomic Habits, uh, you were talking about blogging earlier with your book. Um, that's actually how Atomic Habits was originally written. Everything he blogged out about all of it, and then they just compiled it into one place where you can get all of it. Um, so he was in by intention dripping it out to people and giving them little tiny steps to take to then get to. Um, and we all make the mistake of, I, I was in a men's group where we had to read it over the course of just one month. Um, you know, when we all make the mistake of rather than really catching the cool stuff in there, we make sure that we've read enough of it that for the next week's group, we know, uh, you know, we can have a legitimate discussion about what was in that section. Interesting. Interesting. Now, where do you see kind of the future of the book industry? Um, well, I have a really radical vision, actually, of, of <laughs> the books of the future. It. If you want to hear the, the really way out there, um, if you're familiar with what an NFT is, um, I believe that eventually all books will become NFTs. Um, and more importantly, the courses or the 
uh, whether it be TED Talks or, or keynote speeches, will also be an attached part of that NFT. Um, and that books themselves will be, for the most part, likely given away. Um, and that the money will come from the empowering of people because for every person that's a creator, um, you know, there's like 90, I think it's like 96% of the population that creates nothing. You know, I think the Facebook stat said that um, uh, out of 100% of people, only 1% of them actually write posts and only 4% of them are the ones that like and comment to posts. Um, you know, so the other 96% of the people are just along for the ride, you know, they, they read them, but they don't even hit the thumbs up button. Um, and so I believe that in giving content to that vast majority of the people that they can then regurgitate, whether it be for their uh, course or their podcast or their whatever, that eventually we will see the truly prolific uh, authors Um uh, moving more in that direction. Now, that's a very long-term vision. Um, don't expect to see that in the next year or two, but if you see that happen in 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, um, you will understand why Steve talks about being the extreme visionary um, <laughs> versus just, you know, on the bleeding edge. I talk about being out in the air in front of the bleeding edge of the sword. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. You know, in fact, that brings me into another point, folks. If you see these social media posts at the Shades of ER posting, Steve's information will be on there. Please like it. Please just, you know, hit the thumbs up. Don't scroll by. I'd love to see you guys like it. I would love to, I don't know who's listening. So I'd love to hear uh, you guys' input. Feel free to comment on some of the episodes that you've seen. Let us know what you like about the episode. We'd love to hear about what episode you guys love the best. Uh, feel free to email me directly. Either way, I'd love to hear from you guys. Now, now, Steve, what is some advice you can give to a, a, an aspiring author, somebody that wants to get into the writing industry? Um, the number one piece, most importantly, is that somebody's waiting on you. There is a person, they may even literally be on Google right now as we're talking, searching for the answer that is contained in the thing that you do probably so easily that when you think about what book I should write, that's probably not what you're thinking. It's just so easy for you that you assume everybody must know how to do that thing. Um, but it's really important because somebody needs that. Um, and secondarily is, is that you have a purpose. There's a reason for everything you've been through and you'll be, you know, new, better, more five, 10, 15 years from now, but it's where you are right now. Um, there's somebody that needs that and, and, and it needs to be shared. So don't hold back. I love it. You know, and we're talking about social media information, Steve, what about your social? What's your website? How can folks get in contact? If maybe they're interested in writing a book. What's your information? How can they get a hold of you? So my website, thrivingbestsellers.com, um, you know, talks about everything for our company, but I made it even easier for the listeners because sometimes going through a website and looking at all those kind of things, especially because it's kind of a corporate based website, um, I made it really easy. I gave, I have a free gift for your people. If they go to ongoingwealthguide.com, that's ongoingwealthguide.com. Um, I put together a free gift. It's a little short five-step program for truly being able to create and market and have an abundant flow like we were talking about so that you don't have that 90-day up and down roller coaster, but you can consistently have that. Um, that's yours absolutely for free. And what I've even done is on the thank you page where you can download that, you can also click a button um, and hop in and, and schedule a 15-minute call for free to talk to me. Perfect. Perfect. So again, that's ongoingwealthguide.com. I will have that information folks that are listening on the newsletter. So we'll go ahead and have that information on the newsletter. Steve, thank you again so much for being on the show. Is there any last words you'd like the listeners to know? Don't wait. It doesn't take that long. You could be a best selling author, if not in a month, um, at the most in the next 90 days. Um, and remember, somebody's waiting on you. So go for it. Share who you are with the world. Maximize while it's called today. I love it. I love it. So folks, 
Don't forget to reach out to Steve Kidd if you're interested. I'm Steve. I might actually chat with you after this dang, this dang interview right now. Uh, but no, again, folks, thank you again so much. You can follow us at The Shades of E on all the social sites. We're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and sometimes TikTok. You can also subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com. Again, Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. We will have the information for thriving bestsellers on the newsletter. Again, that ongoingwealthguide.com. So that's free for you, the listeners. I We'll have that on the newsletter as well. Steve, thank you again for uh, uh, joining the show today. I really do appreciate it coming on and telling us about your business. I'm really excited to learn more about it. And so, folks, uh, thank you again for listening and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.